Hey you guys, welcome to my Tomes of Terror show. This is my little uh, book review playlist that I have going on here. I put up one a week on Mondays, uh, in case you're new here. So the book that I'm talking about today, uh, this is a book by Sergio Gomez. Now I actually, this is the second uh, thing of his that I read. If you'll remember just a couple months ago, right back around Christmas time, I think, I reviewed one of his uh, novellas, which was called The Visitor. Uh, and I did it because it was kind of like a Christmas story. It was like an alien attack kind of thing, like set around Christmas in a diner. And um, I did actually enjoy that one quite a bit. I thought that it um, probably would have benefited from being fleshed out more because it was quite short. And uh, it probably did need some editing because there was a lot of grammatical errors in it. But overall, like a pretty good book. But this one, I had been wanting to read this one for a while because a lot of, um, you know, kind of other book reviewers and stuff that I follow on YouTube had really highly recommended this one and this one actually came out uh, I believe before The Visitor. I think this came out back in late summer of 2019 and a lot of people covered this one uh, so I finally got around to reading it because it's available on Kindle Unlimited so when I saw it pop up I was like oh you know might as well pull the trigger on that one and this one is called Camp Slaughter. Now uh, the cover and the title should clue you into the fact that this is essentially, I, I wouldn't call it like a, a parody, but it's a slasher, like an 80s slasher homage is what it is. So what you have is there's a prologue in which uh, a married couple who have been married a long time and they're kind of, you know, bored with one another or whatever. So they decide that they're going to take this romantic getaway out to uh, supposedly the most isolated cabin in Pennsylvania. And they're going to go out there and have a, you know, a little vacation or whatever, uh, not really knowing all that much about this place other than, you know, it looks really nice. The price was right. It's isolated, blah, blah, blah. So they're going to go up there and like spice up their marriage. So they get up, they get out there, and um, it will surprise no one, this is a slasher novel, uh, that they end up, well, at least one of them ends up getting horribly murdered. The husband, who was, I think his name is Steven, he basically just gets an ax to the face and is dispatched, like, pretty quickly. Uh, whereas you're not entirely sure what happens to the wife, Nadine, because that's kind of where it ends. So then we jump forward a year. And for the first probably third of the book, like I said, other than the prologue, you're kind of setting up all of the characters that are inevitably going to go out to the same cabin. So it's essentially like two different sets of people. So you have your kind of obligatory college age uh, group. And there's a lot of them, and I can't remember all of their names exactly because that was one thing. I did actually really like this book. It's super fun. It's really fast-paced. As I said, if you're into 80s slashers, then you will probably just love this because, as I said, it's a lot of fun. But I will say that there are a lot of characters, which I guess they do that in slasher movies and stuff like that too because they need more, you know, more people for the, for the slasher to kill. But, but in a book... And this book isn't that short. It's probably like 350 pages, something like that, maybe even a little bit longer. Although I will say that it's a very quick read. I, th I read it in one sitting, just in maybe two or three hours. So it really does fly by. Uh, and the prose is actually quite just no frills, but I think that really works well for this type of story. So, but I will say that there are a lot of characters and it's kind of hard to, I mean, he does make an effort to give you some backstory on each one of them. Um, but a couple of them kind of fall between the cracks because you don't know as much about them. But there are a few like that, you know, where the details are kind of filled in because they do, you know, he does want to make you like care about them before they get killed off because I'm sure this will not be that much of a spoiler, but because it's a slasher, but pretty much everybody gets dispatched like without too much, uh, you know, thing about it. So the college age kids, there's a bunch of them. There's like, um, but it's the, the two main guys are Gavin and Fred. And they're kind of like, they've been best friends for a really long time, but they've been kind of uh, starting to drift apart, I guess, because Gavin is more like wanting to maintain that sort of party lifestyle. Whereas Fred is kind of like getting older and more mature and wanting to, you know, finish college and get a good job and blah, 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 and get on with his adult life. So they're still hanging out, but you know, there's still, there's a little bit of kind of distance growing between them. Also, Fred has a crush on this girl named Noelle, 
and they've kind of been, they're not dating, but they've been kind of like hanging out and kind of like talking and stuff. So Gavin says, well, why don't you just invite her up there? I'm inviting a whole bunch of people and it'll be really fun. They also end up inviting uh, this other girl named Vanessa and then another girl whose name I can't remember. And then one of them brings like their douchey cousin whose name is Dalton, which I do remember because they made a point of saying he was named Dalton like in Roadhouse, which I thought was very funny. So that's why I remembered that. But uh, so there was that. And then Gavin gets forced to take along his younger brother, Wayne, who was only 14, uh, because Wayne calls up the parents and is like, hey, Gavin's like going and he's going to leave me all by himself. So the parents like make him take uh, take him up there with him. They also take this other guy named Fletcher, who's like the drug dealer guy. He's the guy they buy all the weed from. And uh, I saw one review on Goodreads that said he's essentially Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, which he kind of is. He's kind of like the, the quintessential like laid back pothead. Uh, you know, kind of kind of hippie dude. So he comes along as well. So there's that whole group going on. But then there's this other, it, there's not really a group because it's just two of them. But it's this older guy named Emeril and a younger woman named Molly. And they're business partners. They have kind of like a YouTube show or some kind of podcast or something like that where they investigate uh, paranormal stuff. So he's like a paranormal investigator and she's like a documentarian. So they work together. And initially they uh, get interested in this area where this uh, cabin is, where this all this stuff's gonna take place or Camp Slaughter as it's called. Camp Slaughter is kind of like at first, it's it's kind of like portrayed as like an urban legend. They're like, well, you know, over the years, you know, people have gone up into this particular uh, isolated stretch of woods where there's rumors that there used to be a camp up there and some people have never come back. So as I said, the, uh, you know, the couple from the beginning, it's weird because the couple from the beginning, obviously the dude got murdered and they found him in the laying in the kitchen with an ax in his forehead and they didn't find his wife, Nadine. Uh, you find out what happens to her later on. But it was in the news, but I guess it wasn't like a big enough deal for a lot of people to have heard about it. So actually all the college kids, they didn't really hear about like one of them like Googled the place and was like, oh, this couple like disappeared or they didn't come back. Or actually, no, they didn't find the, um, I was going to say they didn't find the, um, the husband's body because... The killer, uh, and this is not a spoiler because I think that it's on, it's on the blurb of the book, is a cannibal. So he always goes and, you know, he doesn't want to waste the meat <laughs> when he kills somebody. So uh, he basically cuts them up and eats them. So they didn't actually find a body. They just found uh, two people. They had gone up there and they disappeared. So Camp Slaughter is supposedly like this urban legend. Supposedly these people go up here and disappear, don't come back, and nobody knows what happens to them. And there have been rumors circulating that there is somebody out there, a cannibal, that is uh, every now and then, every time some, you know, whenever somebody goes up there, he goes and like picks them off and then they never find them again. Um, and again, this obviously this rumor is going to turn out to be true. So the paranormal investigator and the documentarian, Emerald and Molly, they um, initially want to go up there and make uh, a documentary about this Camp Slaughter legend. And Emeril, who is actually like a very serious believer in the paranormal, thinks that there's probably some kind of paranormal shit going on up there too. And so he basically wants to go investigate that. But then when they get up there and start asking around like to the locals and stuff, that's when they find out, oh, we think there's actually like a serial killer out there who's picking people off and eating them. And that's why they're never finding the bodies. At which point they're kind of like, okay, now this got really interesting. So now we're going to like try and find out where this place is. So they kind of go through one of the locals he kind of roughly knows where it is, so he kind of draws him a map. I'm not entirely sure, like, what... I guess this is supposed to be set in, like, contemporary times, but I do kind of feel like, yeah, because a lot of them had cell phones and stuff, but just like in a lot of more modern horror movies, they have to kind of take cell phones out of the uh, out of the equation, obviously, because, you know, otherwise things would be resolved too easily. So, uh, you know, making this uh, area very remote where they no one can get a signal, uh, so there's that whole situation as well. So you kind of have these two things going on. So the, you have all the college kids and they get up there and then they kind of run into the paranormal investigator team and they don't really team up, but they're just kind of like, um, you know, they're talking to each other about what the hell's going on. Now, while all of this is going on and you're kind of jumping back and forth between all the different characters, you're also privileged to the viewpoint of the actual killer. So... 
I don't know if it's a third, it's probably like a quarter of the book is actually told from the cannibal's point of view. He's a guy named Ignacio. And he goes by, I can't remember what uh, what the Spanish name was, because Sergio Gomez is actually a uh, Mexican, was born in Mexico, but then moved to the United States when he was young with his family. Uh, so his uh, serial killer is named Ignacio. He's real into like uh, the whole luchador thing. Uh, so he likes masks, but he makes masks out of human skin. Uh, so he's very much like a leather face type character. Um, he also has a lot of stuff going on with uh, some Jason Voorhees kind of action too, in the sense that, He's really big, like he's six foot five, and he's like um, unnaturally strong. He also has like really, really super good hearing, and uh, but he's not that bright. He's a little bit, uh, you know, mentally challenged, I guess. Not to a not to a point where he can't uh, function because he does have kind of like a job. Like I think he works as like a janitor or something like that, like in a, a restaurant or a hotel or something like that. Because they do have one scene like that. But, you know, he's not, he, he's aware of his uh, limitations, though, because he'll, he'll think to himself, it's like, oh, my brain doesn't work right or something like that. And he can't have too many things going on at once because, you know, he won't be able to figure them out. Now, interestingly, this, he's kind of an interesting character. And it's, even though he's obviously a monster, you do kind of feel a little bit of sympathy for him because, they do, um, you know, Sergio Gomez does go into kind of like his history where he was raised in Mexico. Um, his dad was like a drug dealer. And from the time that Ignacio was a little kid, um, he was like seeing his dad like enforcing, you know, people that didn't pay him or whatever, like he cut off their fingers and shit like that. So little Ignacio was seeing that. And, uh, I guess like the dad gets killed and then he gets very close to the mom and then the mom ends up getting getting murdered and much like Jason Voorhees, uh, Ignacio keeps the head of his mom uh, like on a pole and almost kind of makes like a weird like um like a shrine to her as I said much like in um in Friday the 13th part two uh, is what I'm guessing that was homaging. I forgot to mention too that I can't remember what the what his Spanish name was but he goes by the name what the hell was it? Uh, it means many faces. Uh, so like I said, much like Leatherface, you know, not only when he kills somebody, if he likes the look of their face or he thinks their face is like big enough to fit over his face, because I guess he's got kind of a big face, um, then he'll cut the face off and keep it and like make a leather mask out of it so he can like switch him out. And again, like Leatherface, he sometimes puts makeup on him like to make himself look pretty and things like that. So, uh, so as I said, this is very much... And, you know, and, and this is going to sound mean, but it's it's very much a, much a pastiche, but it's supposed to be. So it doesn't really bother me all that much because, yes, even though the killer is a combination of a lot of different movie killers and a few real ones as well. Because I think there's some Ed Gein thrown in there. There's some other shit, too. But it's but that's OK. I don't I don't really mind. And like I said, I like that Sergio Gomez is like playing with all these kind of horror movie tropes, like slasher movie tropes and just making a fun, you know, like I said, he's not even doing like a meta type of thing or nothing like that. This is just a fun, straightforward slasher story that uses elements from a lot of different slasher movies. So if you like that kind of thing, then you'll probably like this as well. I will say, too, that. I thought it was interesting, and that was one thing. I kind of wish that this had been a little more explored. Maybe it will be because I think that Sergio Gomez has said that he wants to write uh, essentially like a sequel to this because it is the end of it is left open uh, if he wanted to write another one in the same universe. And so maybe he'll explore this more. There is a paranormal aspect in this, uh, in the sense that, you know, the paranormal investigators that go up to Camp Slaughter and they're investigating it and stuff, they're like the guy, Emeril, is apparently kind of has a lot, you know, sensitivity to that. And he senses that there's like all these kind of spirits out there of all the people that have been murdered. And Ignacio, the killer, many faces, he sees ghosts. So he, and he doesn't even really think it's all that weird because... Like I said, he's not super bright, so he doesn't seem like aware that it's strange that other people can't see them, but he can see them. Like he sees his mom, he sees his victims just kind of like hanging out in the woods. So he sees ghosts all the time. There's also one of the college students, I think it's Noel actually. Uh, is it? 
What was, oh, the other girl's name is Brooke, that's right. Uh, but I think it was Noelle. And uh, a little bit of her backstory is that prior to her, like maybe a year or two prior to her going on this trip, um, her sister, who was 16, was killed in an accident. And so she's kind of dealing with survivor's guilt and like being like, maybe the accident was my fault. And, and so she actually does see her sister. And it's hinted that maybe like most of the time it's a hallucination, but then like toward the end when she's in danger and she's, you know, running away from the killer, there does seem to be a place where the ghost of her sister does like show up and actually like help her. So there's a lot of kind of, there's like little hints of paranormal stuff going on here too, which I like that because you don't see that in a lot of slashers. And, at, you know, as I said, I kind of wish it had been explored more because, you know, the killer, Ignacio, who's actually like a pretty cool character, even though obviously he's a monster because he just uh, chops people up. And this is very gory, by the way. So if you're not, if you're not really, because it's, it's kind of one of those movies, like I said, just like Friday the 13th or something like that, where part of the fun is seeing the way in which these people get get bumped off you know what I mean because it's always like really really gory like there's always you know arms and legs being cut off heads being cut off just all kind of crazy shit like that so it's very very gory very bloody but like I said you know very over the top and fun in that sense but I liked that since Ignacio was you know such a you know such a combination of movie serial killers you know that we've already seen I thought it was actually like a cool something that was more like original to him that he could actually see ghosts. And I thought that that was, I, I thought it was gonna play into the story more. It does play into the story some, but I felt like it kind of played more into the story, like into the story more with the victims rather than with him. Um, so I kind of hope that if he does another one, because if he writes a sequel to this, I will totally read it. Cause I actually did have a lot of fun with this one. I kind of wish that, that it would play into the plot more. The fact that Ignacio could see ghosts in the woods, that the woods were full of ghosts and, you know, the ghost of his mom and stuff. And I, I thought that was like a really cool aspect of his character. So I kind of hope more is done with that. So as I said, this is just, it's not, you know, it's not meta, it's not a parody, it's not doing anything like that. It's just taking all the best shit that you like about 80s slasher movies, just uh, you know, the tropes of it. Here's like these college students. There's a skinny dipping scene, you know, hot girl skinny dipping. There's, you know, the, a whole romance subplot that doesn't work out. There's kind of like all this other stuff going on. So it's like a lot of stuff from, you know, from just regular slasher movies, but just done in a really, really fun way. This is just a fun, entertaining, gory book and like i said don't get attached to pretty much any of these characters because they pretty much all get killed and one thing too is that he killed and i'm i think like i saw some people like that didn't like this too much but i kind of liked it because i feel like sometimes in some types of horror movies not so much slashers but where you have like it'll be like a big deal like when some of the like when some of the characters get killed this one it's it, he's very like unromantic about it you know what i mean it's just kind of like he doesn't care if it's a 14 year old kid or a hot girl or whatever everybody's gonna get fucking killed and because the the killer doesn't really care about it he just sees them as meat and you know and they're in my woods and i'm gonna kill them and eat them now one thing that he does have too that i forgot to mention but you know nadine from the beginning like she was in the prologue where her husband got killed and then like it jumps ahead a year she has actually been alive this whole time because it turns out that ignacio if he now and then like finds a, a woman like a victim that he likes uh he keeps them now, Nadine, she got had her like legs cut off, or just her feet, I think. He cut off her feet, and he keeps her in a barn, and he calls them his Barbies. Now, he doesn't like he doesn't seem to have any kind of like sexual anything. Like he seems very childlike, but he likes having these little dolls around to play with. Uh, you know, that he can put makeup on and shit like that. So one of the college girls who comes there later, I think it's Vanessa. Uh, is a girl that looks like his mom. So that's another thing too, is that Nadine, who's been alive and chained in the barn with no feet this whole time um, for like a year, uh, you know, she's worried because now she's going to get replaced 
because he's seen this other girl and he's like, I can't, he's like, my brain doesn't work right enough to take care of two Barbies at once. So I'm going to have to like get rid of this Barbie. And he kind of feels like bad about it. So he's, like I said, he's a very interesting character. I don't want to go too far and say he's like a sympathetic character because obviously he's a serial killer and a cannibal, but he's so childlike and he's so like not all that smart that he, I mean, he seems to know what he's doing is bad, but he, I don't know. It just, he doesn't seem to take it all that seriously, I guess. He also seems to have a little bit of, and I got kind of a Dexter vibe from him too. No, well, not, I don't want to say that because then you'll think, oh, it's, you know, somebody that kills serial killers. He's not like that. Uh, in the sense that Dexter always said, like, he had like, what did he call it? Like the dark passenger or whatever. Yeah, many faces, Ignacio has that too. And it's almost kind of like he has a split personality. So like he has, you know, the him that's sort of, childlike uh you know and kind of he's still a killer but not as much but then he has this other side of him that sort of like flips into so it's almost kind of like he has a split personality a little bit so there's that kind of whole thing going on too so as i said if you're really into 80s slasher movies uh, and you want to read a book that is essentially like an 80s slasher movie like in book form then you know, then this would be probably be right up your alley. As I said, it's not doing anything super original. It's not nothing like that. It's just taking all the slasher tropes and, you know, playing with them, you know, and just making just a fun, quick, entertaining read out of it. And honestly, I had a really good time with this. I thought it was super fun. And uh, like I said, if he writes a sequel to this, then I will absolutely read that as well. So uh, if you've read it, let me know what you thought about it in the comments. And that will do it for this Tomes of Terror. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.